Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, event. Uh, we have uh, distinguished uh, visitors from uh, Nian Gongsi, our previous uh, vice deputy vice chancellor, uh, Professor Huang, and uh, the famous Wong family, and all the Dr. Tan's friends and uh, students and colleagues. Uh, we are very privileged uh, this evening that we have uh, Dr. Tan Ik Kun, who is our speaker and performance uh, this evening. Dr. Tan Ik Kun uh, graduated from University of Singapore with first class honours and also a doctoral degree. Over a span of 40 years, he dedicated himself to champion and to pioneer the drive to establish the hospital and Singapore as a cornerstone of administrative ed, uh, excellence in clinical biochemistry and health science laboratory services. So he's very well known in Singapore General Hospital. Um, he is he has been appointed to uh, board and management positions in many local, regional and world professional bodies, including Singapore Professional Centre, the Singapore National Science Council, the Asian and Pacific Federation of Clinical Biochemistry, the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, and the World Health Organization. He has authored and co-authored more than 140 scientific papers on many aspects of clinical biochemistry and sat on the editorial boards of the profession's more renowned international journals. He is a strong arts practitioner and advocate since his school days as an accomplished pianist, he has won several open piano competitions and national music composition competitions in Singapore and Malaysia. He has received many accolades and awards, which include the Public Administration Medal, Public Service Medal, and many others and the Singapore General Hospital's Special Award for Dedicated and Distinguished Service. So tonight's program, Dr. Tan, in the first segment, will share how he balances a fulfilling life between his science-centric accomplishments and arts-driven passions through selected images and personal anecdotes. Following a break, Dr. Tan will continue the program with a piano recital featuring the works of famous composers. And he has been here in the morning and afternoon to rehearse. So without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Tan to the stage. Thank you very much, Prof Wong, for the kind introduction. First of all, uh, fellow alumni, future alumni, friends, ladies and gentlemen, let me first wish you a happy Chinese New Year. Wish you success, good health, happiness in the coming year of the GOAT. At first, when Prof Wong and Lawrence, as Sia, Prof Lawrence Sia, approached me, to, uh, uh, to give a lecture something like this, to share my experience, I was quite hesitant because I have been a low-key person, rather, you know, so that I can dedicate my, uh, the time to pursuit of my interests uh, with very little, uh, I would say, distraction. So because, you know, uh, to engage in painting, calligraphy, you have to 
it's a very solitary kind of uh, interest or pursuit and you have to concentrate and not too much socializing and so on. So I have been, but I think both of them persuade me that they say that if I share my interests, it might actually um, encourage others, especially the younger generation, that they should develop interests and also hobby or skills other than what they learn in the university for a living, to earn a living. Because that would certainly make life more interesting, uh, especially when they retire. I remember when I was uh, in, uh, the chairman of the Singapore Professional Centre, one of the themes that I organised a convention was preparing for retirement. Even as you start, or even before you start, uh, start studying for a career, you must already prepare it for retirement. Because I've seen too many people, you know, they work the whole life. They become very important CEOs, top of the company, top in the uh, government service. They, work, uh, they have no other interests. So by the time they have to retire, they have too much time in the hand. And then I think that they have a home family problem because they stay too long in the family. They don't used to be staying so long with their spouses and children and they start having quarrels and all that. And they become unhappy because they have no other interests. So I would suggest that, you know, when I share my interest and experience, it's partly to encourage you really to start preparing, start thinking about your retirement time. What are you going to do? But if you have, you know, interest, which in the meantime can earn you more money is much better because I find that my interest in art actually is much better than my investment in art is much better than investment in houses and other things because the paintings that I've collected have actually increased uh, by 10 times, 20 times the value. So those I collected say 1,000, it becomes 10,000, 20,000. And some of those uh, very famous pieces from China, I remember it was in, into something like 50,000, 100,000. So they were an extremely good investment for me. Well, let me just start my, uh, my presentation. Uh, the aim of this uh, sort of session is to share my interests and varied life experience, my joy of art, joy of nature, and joy of music. Then this slide shows that I just want to summarize uh, the area of interest I've been involved in. Firstly, my job, of course, is in healthcare service. I was involved in actually testing of uh, a variety of substances, you know, inorganic, organic substances present in a human body, fluids, tissues, uh, urine and feces, you know, all the chemicals. So we using a variety of techniques the idea is that this is to help in the diagnosis of diseases and to uh, assess the severity of disease as well as to help in the management. Uh, just to give you some example, for example, if you want to diagnose somebody with diabetes or renal failure, you need to have uh, you know, biochemical tests. And the severity, because the, the test concentration result will indicate how severe it is. And in fact, sometimes they really like titrate how much dialysis they should do, how frequent, and so on. And uh, especially in the area of uh, inherited metabolic disorders, you need to uh, really use a biochemical test result to uh, positively identify uh, inherited met metabolic disorder. I will elaborate on that later on. So the other way is scientific research. We always have to uh, study with our clinical colleagues, those who are looking after patients, uh, to look at uh, how disease process changes and uh, uh, what uh, sort of medical treatment they need. Uh, so and a faster method of uh, diagnosing the problem. So it's, there's always research, and we always have to also look at new methods, faster methods, uh, more accurate methods, uh, they're less prone to you know, problems. Uh, so we, and all these uh, research results have to, are published to be shared with others. So I frequently have to uh, you know, go to conferences and share experience, and we learn from other people's experience too. Education and training. Uh, when I was in the clinical biochemistry, it was a very, very new field. There was no specific training. So in Singapore, uh, all the hospitals, uh, technical staff, have to be trained by us. So I was the, the person who actually designed the courses 
and all those who are involved in all the hospitals, clinical, laboratory will have to go through a five-year program where they need to take official exam before they can be confirmed as staff. Even Brunei sent all their technical staff to the hospital and they can train there. And I was also conducting for a long time, probably for 10 years, I think Professor Wong Hee Ek, who was a biochemistry uh, head there, asked me to help her in organizing a, a course for honor students. So I ran a 10-week course at the General Hospital where we provide both uh, theory you know, lectures and also practical classes for them to get an idea of what is, uh, you know, uh, how about chemistry may be applied to the diagnosis and, uh, of, of diseases. Uh, so I was also involved in the examination of PhD, MD, and MSc uh, candidates. So that is uh, in education and training. And of course, we also been receiving scholars from overseas. This is government ASEAN scholars from Thailand, from uh, you know Philippines, and all that. They came for attachment, and I used to design programs for them. And actually, at that time, there was no university hospital. University teaching was all at the. Singapore General Hospital. So I had to give uh, lectures to uh, medical students. Uh, I think university hospitals started only in mid-1980s. And I was also requested to help in designing and preparing the uh, laboratory, the clinical laboratory for uh, the, the hospital when they were building this hospital. And public administration, of course, there were involved a lot of public administration work, not only in the healthcare, also in the uh, in um, in, in the, uh, the arts area, I was uh, uh, very glad that I was involved in disbursing of grants, administering of grants for the Singapore, I think, Cultural Foundation, which is the pre predecessor of the National Arts Council. Arts Council came much later. So in the uh, Arts Cultural Foundation, we give grants out. I am happy that I've given grants to very prominent groups and individuals. For example, like uh, Joanna Wong, who was my actual classmate in chemistry. Uh, she was uh, very much involved in the uh, theatre, you know, Chinese opera, Cantonese opera. Her group was also benefited from, you know, grants that we gave. And then the theatre works also, you know, drama. And also, I think we had the Singapore Dance Theatre, which started, I became a board member uh, for a long time. in this. And then also individuals who benefited, uh, I remember interviewing, uh, the, I think it was the, uh, uh, the CEO or the director of the Singapore uh, Art Museum. And then I think he has to, uh, now given up the post and then became, I think, an advisor for the National Art Gallery. And among the people who are uh, involved in arts was um, Jimmy Ong, who is now very famous, an artist. He, he went to train in Philadelphia, and his work is fetching a very good price in auctions too. Jimmy Ong, and then another one, Vincent Liao. He was actually an engineer, a qualified engineer, but he decided that he would want to go into arts, into painting full time. So, you know, was uh, applying for a fellowship. And then uh, Huo Pao Kun, you know, the very famous practitioner in theatre, Chinese theatre, and uh, his daughter was applying for, you know, scholarship fellowship to study theatre in, uh, in the United States. So both the daughters applied. So I was glad to be involved in, and also not forgetting two, uh, some distinguished pianists. One is Ko Juan, who is now actually in Vienna. He's teaching now in Vienna Academy, and he has been performing. Occasionally, he come back to give recital. Another one is a lady called Ko Po Kun. Uh, she also in Ger based in Germany. So you know, it was. Uh, I'm glad that you know there was some uh, good work, and I'm associated with some of these uh, uh, artists. Uh, now, the project organization. I was involved with a lot of projects because. Because I think one thing is that a lot of people during my undergraduate days or even after graduation doesn't want to be involved in this and too much work. And I find that actually if you get involved, you grow and you develop. I was very shy, actually was very afraid of coming to the party and give lectures. But when you are involved in all these organizations, there is no choice. You just have to force yourself to do something. So I remember that, you know, uh, 
uh, when they became the head of department, and you, know, you had to give speeches and all that. When I led a team to go to China before commercial tours started, this was under uh, Singapore Professional Centre. I was then the chairman, and I led a group there of mixed professionals of uh, doctors, dental surgeons, and engineers, architects, pharmacists, and chemists, and so on. Every day I have to give lecture. Every day I have to give speeches. Because at that time it was still communist, you know, uh, Mao Zedong just died and Hua Guofeng just came in. In fact, Hua Guofeng just came to, uh, I think, only two years and then quickly changed and later on things Xiaoping came, came in. Then when we went there, you know, they expect you, uh, they treat you like, uh, you know, uh, government officials because there was no such thing as foreign visitors. So every time I go, sometimes one day, two or three times, you have to give speeches, official, because they would give speeches telling. So I, I had to go to the internal security department where they say what you can say, what you cannot say about Singapore. So of course we tried to do a bit of uh, selling of Singapore and so on, but I had to be very careful. But you know, these are part of the uh, uh, training, shall we say, I, I received and I was glad that I was involved in organizing many things. Like for example, I was all helped in organizing this nationwide chemistry contest. At the time, was, I was working uh, for the, I was a council member of the uh, Singapore National Institute of Chemistry. But even before that, we did not have a national institute. For, formerly was Royal Institute of Chemistry, linked to uh, England and Singapore branch. So at that time, I remember we had a great time organizing uh, Pan Singapore, you know, school contest uh, for on chemistry. So each school will uh, give three teams and a speaker and uh, simulated like a symposium. So give them experience. So it wasn't. And then community health, we were also started this community health checks. You know, like uh, dipsticks to test for diabetes, to test for possible renal disease, and you know, high blood pressure and all. So we actually worked. This was a professional centre when I was there. Uh, then we we work with the um, I think people's association so that we can go to the community centre where they organise people to come and then we do all this testing. So we started this testing very young. And then also career guidance. This we started actually. We produce a book on career and also have a large exhibition. And this tradition has carried until today. Every year there is one. And this year's career guidance exhibition is going to be held at Suntech City in March, next month. I think probably it's on the 12th. And also, you know, I was glad to have the experience of holding, organizing many scientific meetings, symposium, international congress, and trade exhibition. Um, at that time, nobody was doing so we had to uh, do it by ourselves. I remember I was using the computer to even enter, uh, uh, use it for uh, all the correspondence and uh, also the booking, the abstracts coming in, and booking of um, uh, uh, hotel rooms. The reason is that because we want to know each uh, candidate, uh, each uh, registrant, where they stay, so that we produce newspaper for the Congress, say five days Congress, every day, every morning, we will deliver the, the newspaper right to the, the room. So there was something rather new. In fact, all the registrants were very surprised that we were able to be so busy during the day and yet take photographs and summarize the abstract of presentations, the more important ones, because there were so many simultaneous sessions, we couldn't cover everything. The more interesting one we will highlight in, in our Congress daily newspaper and then have it delivered in the morning, early morning, before they come to for the next session, we started this. Uh, uh, so it was rather interesting experience. Then uh, this is just to show. Actually, I was a first timer, or uh, really pioneer for many things. Uh, firstly, I say I came from Chinese school. My education throughout, right through, was in Chinese. So actually, it's a mistake to say that Chinese is very difficult to learn. Actually, if you start to learn Chinese first before English, 
you find that it's, it's no threat at all. I find that, you know, when people say so hard to learn, I say one thing, it's not hard. I find English is also not, not, not difficult to learn. But if you do the other way, because English is relatively easier to learn, and everybody else is talking, speaking in English, then you find that actually there is an obstacle, you know, and then you want to, wow, you have to remember every word. But when we were young, I sort of, we were just told, okay, write this word uh, maybe 50 times, 100 times to, to remember, and you commit to memory. I remember even, you know, nowadays people are talking, wow, so difficult to speak dialect at the same time. And, but I find that, you know, it just came naturally. When we were young, my neighbors, some of them were speaking Hokkien, Teochew, uh, Hainanese. I was able to pick up all these languages. I still speak Teochew, Hokkien, and Cantonese, and I still can understand some of the higher. And then Malay, you know, and because there were some Malay children in the Kampong. So languages are no problem, and it is actually a big advantage if you know Chinese. If you are actually a scholar in the future, going upon scholarship to overseas, people respect you and actually they share more with you because they are interested to know your culture. You actually tend to be looked down if you do not know any Chinese culture and you can't speak the English culture. So I find that I was very, uh, uh, very well treated, uh, shall we say, because they are all interested. And then when we go to Chinese restaurant, especially, you can see that all these uh, waiters were sneering and laughing at uh, my friends, Chinese friends, a Singaporean friend, who are not able to even order a food from the menu because they are all in, in Chinese. They say, how come these people are Chinese that don't even know their own, own, own language? And then you are served better, less, no, not so good, the food are not so good. Because the best food are only by mouth. You will say, I want this, I want this. So usually when there, I speak with the Hong Kong, I tell them in Cantonese what I want, and they say, you know, these are not in the menu, but we only reserve for people who can speak Mandarin, who can speak Cantonese. But those who cannot, they speak with the Western, westernized Chinese food. So, so, and then overseas too, you know, if you are able to have some culture like music and, um, and, uh, um, and um, sort of language, huh, people tend to uh, be more willing to share uh, with you. I remember whenever I go, I find that, you know, we always make music very easily. You know, sometimes it's household concert. When I stay in UK, it was in the British Council, where I gave a concert at the British Council. And when I went to Washington, New York, many of these uh, people who I, I got attachment to, you know, in the hospital, they are actually fairly good musicians. So we had some instantaneous, just uh, on the spot, impromptu uh, music making, which is quite fun. So I remember when we played trios, we played quartet, and, and all that. So it was a great deal of fun and that break down a lot of eyes. You know, when you want to learn something from people, you know, and if there is no the, uh, barrier, I think you find it much easier. So I encourage you to develop a more interest so that people find you more interesting. Uh, then I, I was also the first candidate. You see, after my Chinese school, um, I entered uh, university directly. After that time, you know, A-level was just introduced. So we were the guinea pigs, no previous questions, answers to follow. We did not know what that question, uh, it would be like. So I was the first batch. And at that time, I remember the whole of Singapore, we experienced a huge strike. Chinese school, all strike. We, we, we could not go to school. For a few months, there was no classes. Because students protested, you know, that why come suddenly, you know, the, the whole system changed. So nobody knew how the question would, would be like. So I was a pine, uh, so I was one of the few who took the exam, and then one of the few who get entered, uh, admitted to the university. So there were 14 of us, I think, uh, but eventually in, in the, in the A-level A class, but eventually I think four of us uh, were admitted, myself, and then uh, Prof. Peng Suan, who became the mathematics head of mathematics department. He is retired now. And then there was one who was a psychiatrist, consultant psychiatrist in the Institute of uh, Mental Health. And then another one uh, who was, uh, I think, a pharmacist who actually worked in the Ministry of Health looking after the poisons, poison inspectorate. So uh, four of us were, were there. So we, now, then we, I was also the first batch for biochemistry. Nobody knew what biochemistry course is like. So it was a fight. I think there's no more biochemistry full time. It actually got incorporated into what is called biological, uh, biological science, right? 
so and, and biochemistry became part of it. But at the time, we were studying biochemistry together with the medical students all, all full time. And also at that time, honors class for biochemistry was also the first time introduced. So we, we, <laughs> we went into it as a pioneer for this. Then when it came to profession, I was also the very first full-time trained clinical biochemistry. There was no such thing as clinical biochemistry in Singapore. Uh, at first it was started just with, you know, some technical staff supervised by a clinical uh, a doctor and all. But this has uh, now developed uh, very, very well uh, developed science and there are many uh, professional journals uh, sort of devoted to it. Then I was also the first to, to study for, for, for the exam. This was, oh, sorry. This was actually first introduced even in the UK. I was the first batch in the UK to take the exam. Uh, it was a postdoctoral exam called Mastership uh, in Clinical Biochemistry. And it was actually uh, held under the four bodies, Royal Institute of Chemistry, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry, then the uh, College of Physicians, College of Pathologists. So these are the four uh, professional bodies which organize this exam, you know, for UK. And, and they, I was fortunate that they recognized the training in Singapore. Otherwise, you had to stay there for five years. It was a five years postgraduate experience and having worked in a clinical laboratory. And then the first graduate to be invited by the cabinet to serve in top management. How did it come about? When I was reaching, the, I was at the top of my career. Uh, one day, I got an invitation for lunch from cabinet ministers, and I think that was in the late uh, 70s. And I was asked whether I would like to consider uh, going into politics and join them. Uh, I thought for a while and I declined. The reason is that because I find my profession very challenging, it's a very new profession, there is a great deal that I can do to, to help to develop and subsequently, and true enough, because even in the profession, uh, I think I'm quite well known in Asia Pacific and, and in internationally because of my involvement in promoting clinical biochemistry and laboratory medicine. So I felt that since you know uh, nobody else, I was the very first one, I might as well stay in this area rather than going into politics. Uh, then I was, I was asked, what about going into culture, because they knew that I, for a long time, I was, uh, you know, playing music and uh, I like art and all. So they said, what about going into National Theatre, to be chairman of National Theatre? So I said, what does it involve? Uh, let me know what are the positions there. They said, National Theatre chairman, mainly in administrative position and particularly important in sourcing for funds uh, um, to, to support, you know, the uh, promotion, uh, cultural promotion work. Then I said, then the, 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 then the other position is the deputy uh, chairman. The deputy chairman has all the work because he will have to do the administration, has to look after all the performing groups because under National Theatre, there was a national choir, there was a national dance company, national Chinese orchestra, there was a dance circle, uh, and so on. And each group has got its activity and we have to provide funds from the National Theatre to fund this. And in addition, there is this impresario work which involved big performing group because National Theatre was the only group which can invite performing groups from companies from communist country, like, you know, from China at that time. I remember people like Li Lian Jie, Jack Lee. He was invited during my time, you know, then he as a martial art, as part of the whole martial art group. And then we were inviting like Liu Xiaoqi, many of the famous uh, film stars, uh, in China was invited to, to be at the National Theatre. So it was a rather actually quite challenging uh, work. So I said, okay, I will take on the uh, deputy chairman, let the chairman go to someone who has got good connection. And that went to, I think, the late Mr. Ken Tai, who was a uh, uh, senior president of Pricewaterhouse because he has got a good connection with a sort of Shaw Foundation, Look Foundation, and many other foundations as an, in an accountant firm they are in this area. So I said, this is best, you know, he's best suited for this. And of course, he doesn't want to have spent so much time. So 
you know, for me, I enjoyed doing it. So at one time, actually, more or less, I was uh, morning in the in in the hospital, and then part of the time in the ministry of health, of culture, and then after part of the time, especially at night, most of the nights, especially when there are performances, I have to look after all the VIPs. So if that is like. Um, you know, art festival. I would one stretch probably attend something like 25 out of 30 performances. I still enjoy them. I now still buy tickets to support uh, all these shows. Uh, so it was actually uh, real fun, uh, although it takes a lot of time. Um, then I was uh, doing founding president of the Singapore, uh, uh, that is a profession, clinical biochemistry. And in order, because I, we were organizing a congress, and in order to organize a congress, you cannot just have a group of person. I remember that time we were just barely something like seven person or to ten person really in the field. So we said, how do we handle? Because these congresses are thousands of people, you know, and then you have to do publicity. There was no such thing. Many countries at that time have no national association. And that was why I said that was a challenge. Because we used to say, for example, Singapore, we used to send people to uh, UK for tra training, not even Australia. It, Australia was later on. And that, that, at the time, not so much uh, interaction with UK, uh, well, with uh, United States. And whereas, you know, I think it was infancy in, for this profession uh, in the whole region. I think like Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, those are very, you know, this is not very well developed. So. China, even China and Taiwan, not so well developed. So when I had the I, I was asked, in fact, uh, by international community, why don't you start organizing a conference for your region so that people can learn from each other, can have interaction, and they can be updated on advances in the field. So I said, okay, I will, I will do it. So in spite of the very small number, we registered as a society, and so become the association. Then the, then the first Congress attracted almost 1,000 people. So it was a, a challenge. It was so successful that I was asked to do a second one. And then the other professor, uh, the other professor also asked me, for example, Prof. Sao Chi Seng, probably the famous forensic pathologist, whose uh, stories are still being shown as dramas over TV. I, I just recently saw some, it was from his story, like the, the person who got dismembered and then got killed and then cut into pieces to cook curry. Uh, no, those are one of the morbid stories that we have. And then, you know, uh, so it was, uh, uh, let me see. And as a result of organizing this conference, at the time Singapore was looking for avenues to, to make Singapore more famous and more tourists to come to Singapore. So it started a bureau called Convention Bureau, Singapore Convention Bureau. And I was working closely with Jenny Chua. She was the first uh, head of the Convention Bureau. Of course, later on, she took on, she moved to Raffles Hotel, she became CEO, and then uh, many other things. She was. But we were working very closely, and she needs somebody to help her to promote, because she can't do the promotion, because they need association. So I was asked to actually go uh, to many different countries and try to um, get conventions, international congresses to come to Singapore, and also to speak at uh, uh, the conventions, uh, organized function, where they invite many uh, uh, sort of associations, like pharmacy associations, then dental, and uh, the medical. So I will go and speak, actually, and tell them how to organize congresses and what is the advantage. The idea is to build Singapore into a world convention center. So at first to be an Asian convention center, but in the end to be top convention center. And now, Today, actually, we are quite well known as a convention center. I was very glad I was part of this process. And we were asked to actually give feedback about you know, what facilities and how they should be in uh, proximity with each other. Because I know, you know, I have been attending, uh, a, a sort of registered for other conventions and holding convention ourselves. We know what is good for, uh, for the participants. Because sometimes, for example, I say, 
The exhibition area is so far away from the scientific area. Once we go there, we can't listen, and then, or then there will be less people listening to the talks and so on. So we say one of the important things is never have you know miles away your exhibition, a trade exhibition, and your you know scientific session. So these we give feedback to, for example, Suntec City. Because it was just at the time of building, so they, they did not. So they asked us for feedback for what is required, you know, for exhibition area, for uh, speaking and so on. So every aspect of it, I was glad I was able to learn uh, by ourselves. Uh, then, uh, then, you know, then I st established the Federation of Asian Pacific Federation. Then in order to do this, I had to go to actually Indonesia to help them because they didn't know how to draft, you know, the, the constitution for... So I went there, and then Thailand, I also went there. Subsequently, the congresses held in these countries, like Bali, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, and so I became a consultant and an organizer. So I flew there quite frequently, actually, to, to be uh, helping them in doing the selection of the hotel, the venue, even coming down to to do the uh, actually the proceedings of the uh, of the meeting. Then I was also the first Asian executive member to be in the International Federation Board. It is very important, I find that, because many people when they approach, they don't want, you know, these are extra work, actually, you know, it, it doesn't pay. But actually, when I find that I was in the board, if I was not in the board, many things decided by the International Federation would have decided how you practice your 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 uh, uh, your your craft, your you know your profession. For example, uh, just one thing, you know, in the measurement of enzymes, which is a catalyst in the body, they we, they wanted to actually use as a standard throughout the whole world, 25 degree. Why? Because in actually Europe, especially the Germans, they have a very strong say. And for them, 25 degree water bath or uh, you know incubator is easy for them. But I think how to think of, it's not easy for them. It's much easier to have 37 degree because then you, you're using heating up rather than cooling down. And you know our temperature here, room temperature in many Asian countries are well above 25. So you have, you have, you must have a constant cooling system, and there, there weren't any, and even up to today, they were not catered for. You see, so now and then subsequently, the equipment company, because it also determined on uh, these people who make equipment, which cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, automated machine to do. So they actually subsequently developed for 25 for those who wanted to, but now more or less they have agreed. 37. I told them that after all, our body is 37 degree, and all the enzymes actually working within the body is 37 degree. So why not? And also, it's more sensitive because enzyme activities are higher at 37 degree and become more sensitive for you to measure than you are doing 25 degree. So I felt that it was very important, and as a result, I was able to get interaction and give feedback and I feel that you know uh, I was glad to be able to contribute to this is just one aspect then when I was in WHO actually most of the WHO appointed uh, people are actually recommended from the country itself for example the WHO would write to Ministry of Health say you know we want somebody in this particular field you know can you recommend somebody but in my case actually they write direct to me and then invite me and just inform the, the ministry. So it is quite an honor because that means that they recognize my expertise and not through, because sometimes ministry may not send the right person there. You know, it's some person who may be the head of somebody but may not be the, the best or the expert in those fields. Um, but in this case, they asked me to go and actually I was involved in committees on about the production of vaccine and about the standardization of biological standardization standards and, uh, and also health laboratories, how to set up uh, laboratories in many developing countries. So it was an uh, interesting, uh, rewarding time I spent and, uh, until fairly recently. Then founding member, I was actually requested by Beckton Dickinson, which is a very large American company producing syringes, uh, equipment for, uh, I think, for animal welfare and also for human health care. They have got many, many products. I was asked to be one of the senior uh, advisory board consultants for many years. 
until very recently, and I was glad that you know I helped them to give lectures in China, all over China. It was a very good uh, China, and I find this is again Chinese very important because because they couldn't find anyone to be able to communicate in Chinese. So if you are in China, especially at the earlier time, when not many people speak uh, English, if you speak to English, it's a waste of time. So I'm one of the, I think I was the only one who was able. So I went there to give lectures uh, through like Qingdao, Chengdu, Shanghai, Beijing, and some of the small places in Fuzhou, or all these places. And I had to prepare my slides. At first, I prepared it in English because I'm presenting it in Mandarin. But I said, can you actually, because they want to keep the slide and make it into a publication. So they said, what about we translate for you? And this is one thing you must remember. They translated for me to vet. And to my horror, actually a lot of them were actually mistakes. And not only that, it was opposite of what I wanted to say. So I told them I better do it myself. The reason why is that they rely on the trust too much on the computer. Of course, you can go to computer and they say translate the whole thing. They do have, I have actually tried to use it myself. At first I say save my time. Then I went through several offer and uh, several programs, different programs where you do the translation of a whole thing. I find that actually they go for word for word. So sometimes they twist the meaning and if you are trying to have professional, specialized wording, they don't have. So actually, eventually, I prepared all my PowerPoint slides by myself. And, and it's much better. And I, and I help them to prepare to translate those slides uh, given uh, lectures given by German, by Swiss, uh, <laughs> by people from Scandinavia, because they are pre prepared in uh, English and they say, can you help us? So I had to do quite a lot of uh, this kind of work. So I mentioned that I was first to organize visit to China, and, and that was very interesting. And by the way, I think you all might have just read about the story about the a physiotherapist, an old lady of 80-something, got cheated by a travel guide. <laughs> she was one of my old good friends who joined this professional center tour. Because she was a physiotherapist and her husband was a doctor who qualified to join as provider. So she and her husband joined and became good friends. And subsequently, I became her art consultant. And all her arts, I sort of sourced the, the painting for, for her and I do all the framing and so on. Initially also, I think uh, Miss Pauline Ong here, yeah, the, the her elder sister is Marjorie Chu, and she was one of those uh, uh, gallery. I think she was one of the earliest to, to have a gallery and framing. And so I used to actually go to a gallery and, <laughs> and send my paintings for framing. Uh, Okay, now first South East, now these are the congresses I mentioned. First South East Asia Congress, then Asian Pacific Congress, also in Singapore. First uh, Asian Pacific Congress of Legal Medicine, this is by Professor Sao. So he asked me to help him because, and then Chemistry Congress, which I did list here, Sim Keng Yang, Professor Sim Keng Yang, Chemistry Department was the chairman, and I was helped him. Then the first international symposium on biotechnology. Ah, I must say something. This was when it was, I was in the Science Council. One day, actually, it was near New Year, it was Christmas time, and I got a call from uh, Dr. Go Kang Sui. Dr. Go said, can you write something about, write me a paper on biotechnology? Can you see whether it's feasible to introduce biotechnology to Singapore? So I quickly, there was no biotechnology at all. So I had to quickly go to the library and research all the most up-to-date material and actually, I spent my New Year and my Christmas uh, in the library working on the, the, the paper, but it was very rewarding. Because after I submitted paper uh, with all what other uh, bio company, biotechnology companies were doing in the US and in Europe and all that, uh, I was asked to organize for the Science Council uh, a Congress, an international conference on biotechnology. So we invited Nobel Prize laureates and people who have been involved, uh, including uh, Professor Sidney Brenner, who was uh, also Nobel Prize laureate, to come as speakers 
And at that time, uh, Christopher Chen from uh, Calgary, Canada, uh, one of our biochemistry graduates who was, I think, two years my junior, and also Dr. Chua Nam Hai was also two years my junior, who was in Harvard, he was doing plant uh, uh, biochemistry. Both of them were invited to come back. And then, you know, after the Congress, this was followed up, and it led to the establishment of the Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology, INCB. That's how actually INCB started. I started the biotechnology paper to suggest, uh, you know, give the, my suggestion, and then followed by Congress where these people came, and then Professor Sidney Brenner became the chairman of the first uh, institute. The, the institute has since changed name. And then Chris Tan, Christopher Tan, Inhui, became the director, Hedal. And then Professor, I think, uh, Chua Nam Hai uh, also became a uh, uh, board member and also look after plant development of plant uh, biotechnology. And at the time, also Louis Lim, also, I think, who worked in London. All these people are now actually still in abroad. I think uh, Chua Nam Hai was in Harvard. So, uh, okay. Then, uh, also, International Congress in pre analytic is very unusual because I got uh, an email from China, from the China Medical Association, as well as the China Association for uh, Laboratory Medicine. Both of these, they jointly want uh, to organize a congress about pre analysis. And not many people knew that a lot of things can go wrong. You know, if you do not look after your specimen well. So before even you receive, if something has gone wrong, uh, your result of analysis in the laboratory is, is no use. So actually, so I organized a, a congress in Nanjing for them. Uh, so I have to fly, fly there for a number of times. Now, uh, significant work, I just want to say a few things. For example, new tests. I, we have to introduce and broaden our repertory of tests. As more new investigation came in, we introduced for patients new tests. For example, you know, new tests to confirm the presence of a heart attack. You know, formerly it was using enzyme, and then subsequently there was specific protein, and there are a number of cancer markers now available, what they call tumor markers, to indicate what sort of tumor uh, present, and also the severity of the tumor, uh, and also on treatment, where the successful of treatment. So it was rather interesting, and I was also introducing quality assurance. There was no such thing. I, ISO was not here yet. Now everybody talks about ISO, where in, in various processes to make sure the quality is good. But at the time, there was no such thing. So I was first to introduce quality assurance. Quality means what? Because a lot of people never thought about it. Until, you know, when, until I was involved with this quality, I never thought about it. Because before, when I was in the house, there was no such practice. What we had to do uh, is to monitor all our measuring equipment. For example, your spectrophotometer, if you are in, you know, using it, it has to be calibrated regularly because otherwise the spectrum will go. What you say, you measure as uh, a spectrum of say 530 nanometer, but over time it may actually change and you are no longer measuring that. And also the absorbance also may change, the sensitivity of the instrument. And then what about the balance? Over time, you think your balance is going to function as good as it, your weights actually may, may change, you know, because people are touching it and all that. So uh, these have also to be monitored. And then your centrifuge also has to change, your water bath, and then even your refrigerator. So then we have to introduce a constant monitoring. For example, those specimens that are kept and the reagent, it has to be recorded daily, morning and evening, and, and regular uh, recording of all the checking. And we also have to introduce a specimen, so-called quality specimen, which the person doing not supposed to know. Because we receive many blood specimens from a variety, the whole hospital, but how do you know they are correct? You see? So we, we want to have a specimen which which go through the same process, and then we want to we know the result already. We want to know whether it matches the correct result. And then later on, on uh, let me see. Uh, uh, so I introduced also work simplification because many of these analysis work are repetitive, and it tend to be tiresome after some time. You know, if you do the same thing over again, and tiredness can cause error. And sometimes, you know, in distraction, somebody calls you to the telephone, you talk to somebody, you may forget actually which tube you have added. You might have come halfway, and then when I come back, 
Oh, so maybe some reagent have been added twice, and some maybe no reagent. And in the end, you know, you get uh, mistakes uh, that way. So actually, this is also uh, we feel that you know we need to uh, simplify the work. So we introduce work simplification, and then subsequently automation, and then also reduction of the requirement for specimen and for reagent. So now uh, I, I'm glad to say that you know. With very, very tiny amount, like 20 microliters of specimen, we are able to do 20 or 30 different tests simultaneously. And later on, we introduced computerization. Nobody used a computer at the time. I was the first to introduce it to the Ministry of Health. And because when I was training in UK, I often hear the computer, uh, you know, uh, sort of making a lot of noise, you know, typing away. I was curious to say, what is it doing? Uh, because I was on duty, night duty there, and often night duty, nothing to do. When there's no specimen come, I can hear, you know, I thought maybe some ghost there, there's nobody there, you know, why are they making a lot of noise? So when I went, I see all these computers, all the typewriters going by itself, and they were actually catch, capturing data from the analytical instrument. So, you know, this is one, uh, you, but when, when you must open your eyes when you are abroad, send your training. So I said, hey, this is a good idea. So actually, we develop our own computerization. So what happened is that all analysis actually are sorted out by computer, and then the results are captured by computer, and these are sent directly to the, the ward, where the doctor can see, and they can now see on the screen. And even we can highlight which uh, results are abnormal. And in fact, we also shortened the time of analysis so that instantly the urgent uh, investigation, within 10, 20 minutes, we can finish. We used to do, say, a potassium analysis. It takes hours to set up the, the one one analysis. We used to, we used to scare. We were, my staff would be very scared if they get called at night to do because it would be spending quite a lot of time just to set up the instrument. But now it's no threat. It's very, very, we can do potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, you know, all uh, at one go. Um, now, I was the first one to set up. I, I was asked actually by the Council for the Disabled to set up, uh, to, to find out what is causing all this disability, because quite severe, because they need to have people looking after them. Uh, these patients, they are like, some cannot walk. You know, they may be quite normal uh, during childhood, throughout childhood, and then suddenly when they come to 12 years, 13 years, they start to wither away. You know, they, they, their limbs cannot, they become, uh, their limbs cannot stand, and then they really, uh, they become dead. Some actually develop cancer and all that. I was glad to be able to give, be given a few million dollars to set up, because to set up such a uh, uh, laboratory requires specialized equipment which are not normally uh, used in the routine uh, laboratory. So with that money, I was able to set up and introduce a lot of tests for uh, the, the detection of what we call in, um, inherited metabolic disease. These are inherited from generation to generation. We do have, and I was surprised to find that there were a, a whole variety of uh, diseases which nobody knew and nobody could diagnose because they could not be diagnosed based on clinical examination. It has to be confirmed by a laboratory test, like for example, an enzyme or something that accumulated in the body a lot. And we find, you know, the, compare the pattern is slightly different from, from overseas. Uh, you know, we have patients who, are, who, who had uh, fainting attacks every now and then. And in fact, it turned out to be one of the inherited metabolic disorder, which could be treated just by purely given vitamin. And we had other patients where the parents were very distraught because the patient had to be repeatedly admitted to the hospital every now and then for infection, and very severe infection. For the slightest and thing, then they had to admit. Then we found that the patient had an acidemia called propionic acidemia. Uh, and, uh, and you know, and this acidemia actually caused the body to turn very acidic. And as a result of this acidity, then the metabolism is disturbed, and their immunity is very low, and they get infection every now and then. So eventually, it's a decision whether to let the child live or in the next round, it's very severe, just let the child go. And you know, and then you know, the parents at least get the counselling, and then they say, what about the next chance? 
And actually, there are a number of these cases where all the children are affected in the future. So the advice for them is to have no children, adopt, adoption, because there's no use. But on the other hand, there are some where some children may have the chance to live, become normal. So you have to do that prenatal diagnosis, because before they are born, they already need you know, to have a spar sample of amniotic fluid taken out for examination. And that was very challenging. And I remember one of the most challenging things which led to nationwide screening, to screen every newborn, was an enzyme deficiency. I think some of you may have heard Professor Wong Hock Boon, but I was in, working independently in the government. Professor Wong was in the <coughs> University Pediatric Unit. He was one of those who discovered that, you know, uh, there was very severe jaundice in, in the young children, and that was one of the important cause of death. Because jaundice, the bilirubin, it will go to the brain, and once it goes into the brain, it will cause death or permanent damage where they, be, they become mentally severely retarded. So it is a matter of great concern. So what is the reason for this? So to cut the story short, eventually we found that it was the enzyme G6PD. And in fact, many of our population, you'd be surprised that 3% of our population to, uh, have this. And I think the, the situation seemed to change over the year. I seem to notice this has increased because we have got populations from Thailand, from Vietnam, from the regional country. Actually, some of these countries have very high incidence. For example, some parts of, of, of Thailand have incidence as high as uh, over 10% of the population have this. But this is supposed to, uh, what, what the study say, is to protect against malaria infection. Because malaria is supposed to be endemic in many of these countries. So the more it is that they, somehow the body develop such a deficiency, it's not normal, but it helped them to sort of be resistant against malaria in, infection. So actually then, I went on to study, it was very interesting. The Southern Chinese have this uh, deficiency. In fact, it is so severe that if the person have a deficiency, if they eat uh, this uh, kidney beans, they will experience a hemolysis, very bad hemolysis, which leads to jaundice. And then even if people walk past a field of this fava bean, you know this kidney bean, when in bloom, in flower, they walk past, the, the, the pollen that they may inhale will cause actually very bad hemolysis. And this is called hemolytic anemia. The, the red cells will break up. So I was involved in the, in the government department and developed a new test for it. So in, eventually, it was introduced as a nationwide test uh, for all newborns. In, in, actually, at the time, many people were no longer newborn. They were already in national service. And they were scared that if they are in national service, one day they may become so jaundiced, they're wondering what's happening. Is it the liver uh, severely uh, ill or, or something like that? And actually so we had to, because if they go and take anti-malarial drug, and anti-malarial drug is one of the drugs which can cause, besides all this mothball and all that, so a number of drugs, even high doses of vitamin C can cause hemolysis. So this is uh, something uh, uh, interesting. Oh, incidentally, I just want to tell something, some of the tests which actually pick up unusual uh, sort of phenomena which we did not know. And this is the interesting part. For example, one of our, uh, um, uh, I think, uh, well, I would have one of a lecturer in, in uh, our university uh, had a sort of um, screening test, so a panel of our chemical tests, but, and it was rather strange that all the liver tests indicate there's something wrong with the liver. Although, but the person was going just for health training. That means that she was healthy and just want to make sure that they, he did not have sort of pre-diabetes or kidney disease. So we run a whole panel of tests and strangely the liver tests were all abnormal. Then subsequently what we found is that the person was on a drug for fungal infection of the toe. And these are quite common. You may have fungal infection and given some topical application of a drug called griseoflavin. And this is really very toxic to the body because it just accumulates and accumulates in the body and it goes to all your other organs. And actually, eventually, you know that better take off the drug because you know this is, this is uh, causing a big, a big problem to her. And uh, also, you, they, this other thing is that we, uh, when in the hospital, for every test we do, we have to establish what is normal, what is abnormal. So how can we tell? So we have to have the test done on the uh, representative number of normal, healthy people. 
but who is actually normal? Sometimes you do not know. For example, if you don't test for a measure of blood pressure, you don't know the person has got high blood pressure. And so are other things. So actually, we just assume if the person is walking around, okay, no complaint and all that, we take it as normal. We were surprised that among this normal population, we had up to more than 10%, 15% or so, with abnormal liver function enzyme tests. So we were very, very funny and said, how come then later it came to light because we were studying something else. We were studying with the Australia uh, um, a researcher called Australian antigen. Then this Australian antigen subsequently become known as hepatitis B antigen. So it is an it is a, a transmitted antigen through blood, through body fluid, and all that. And that's why uh, uh, we found that these people are actually having. Hepatitis B infection, silent. Hepatitis B infection has no symptom at all. And it's very dangerous because subsequently it will lead to liver cirrhosis, hardening of the liver, and also to cancer. This is why we find that uh, uh, cancer was very common to Singaporeans, uh, as well, uh, liver cancer at one time. So the government decided to introduce screening. You know, that's why, because it can be transmitted from the mother, to the uh, to a child, you know, during delivery. So now, actually, they are sort of taking precautions, especially to, to ask people to screen for hepatitis B. So this is just uh, some anecdote, some experience uh, that I want to share, why it is so interesting. Now, in, uh, then making, is, I have already mentioned this, uh, promoting, yeah, I was promoting this wish, uh, performing art, art uh, because I was, uh, they have no chance to show their performances. So usually I will include this in my congresses. My congresses, I will uh, hold you know, performances at the Victoria Theatre uh, and Concert Hall. I will engage the SSO. You know, at that time it was not so big now. And then a small group of them will come and perform for my opening. And then I will ask for Singapore uh, Dance Theatre to perform some ballet and Sasitara to perform Indian dance. And then, uh, you know, a number of the, uh, uh, shall we say, um, uh, cultural uh, battalion as recipients actually I work with because I've introduced their group. Because it's a pity when they put up a new dance, there's no opportunity to perform again and again. But they can perform to different groups of uh, people who are attending large conferences. In a way, we are also introducing Singapore culture to them. So I will. Well, these, the next one, uh, I'm going to run fairly quickly because these are, are just uh, slides uh, of pictures. These are just to show you actually one of the big uh, meeting, uh, 30th anniversary of the Chinese uh, Laboratory Medicine uh, Association. I was invited as a chairman and uh, also as a lecturer there. And these are all the two people from uh, international community and also the Chinese uh, community. And this was a visit to actually Beijing's Chaoyang uh, Hospital. Um, I actually was invited to a, a good number of hospitals over time. For example, when Shanghai had its largest hospital, it has 4,000 beds. No, no hospital in the region has so, such a large, you know, 4,000 bed hospital. I was asked to uh, go help and look at the laboratory before they seek for uh, sort of uh, uh, this uh, quality assurance uh, program from, from the uh, uh, from America, they get accreditation before accredited. And also, I was asked to, an even larger hospital was in Chengdu. The Chengdu hospital was between five and six thousand. <laughs> it's a huge hospital. So, I was asked to also inspect, look at the hospital uh, to discuss with them and give suggestion to them. This is uh, one of the visits. And this is uh, another uh, uh, visit in Beijing where you see actually, this is a uh, home from Hong Kong. Uh, he succeeded me as the president of the uh, Asian Pacific Federation, and that one is uh, from sorry, from uh, from UK British Association. Uh, eh? uh, this one is from British Association, and this is from Malaysia. And this is one of the Beckton Dickinson uh, conferences which I attended. And this is actually a visit to the Chengdu uh, hospital where I said they have 5,000 beds. It was a very large hospital. This, uh, this is the chief of the laboratory. And then this is one of the uh, 
uh, meeting in in Fujian Fu Fu province. They have all Fujian uh, from all the cities in Fujian. They organize a conference in Fuzhou. Uh, this is a Senhui. And I was invited there, and there were, I think, about 500 people at this meeting. And this is also on, on quality and pre analytical. And this is another meeting at Hangzhou. It was on the quality of how to you know, sort out problems and prevent uh, problems and also improve quality of analysis. Yeah, this is a, another uh, national congress. And I remember I was also invited to speak and organize a meeting for the military. It was rather strange when the military uh, hospital had its own uh, network of uh, clinical laboratories. So all those people who come are either in the Navy, the Army, or the Air Forces. They all wear uh, their uniforms. And then they also include nursing staff. So it was quite an uh, interesting experience for me to speak to such a mixed group of uh, people. And they, they, oh, this is at the, another congress in Korea, in Seoul. And this was when uh, I was given uh, an award. <clears throat> okay, I, when I was uh, doing my postdoctoral uh, fellowship, I was in UK, and unlike some of my contemporaries who complained a lot about the dullness of London, and then I was actually enjoying myself. So it depends on how you make a, a bit life of it. So I enjoy all the life. I remember uh, Dr. Wong Yidong who is sitting there. Before I went to London, he was telling me about all the youth hostels in, in the Europe and so on. So actually, when I went there, it was a very good tip. So I armed myself with uh, Europe on $5 a day. And then pre-studied them, all the addresses, what food to take, what transport to take. And I traveled all through Europe. And I took the opportunity to visit all the museums, galleries, commercial and national. And also, I visit all the gardens, like you know, in Germany, in Hamburg, in Munich, and uh, it was a great time. And also at night, it's never done. Because I, I often can get free tickets to operas, to ballets, to theatres in Stratford, in London, and the Wigmore Hall, and St. Martin's in the field often have lunchtime concerts. So when I visit the National Gallery at Trafalgar Square, I just pop into the church in St. Martin's in the field and had a, a beautiful lunchtime relaxation there. And it was also close to British Museum. So if you are going on you know, any fellowship, do visit all this. It will broaden your experience, will enlighten you, and make it very interesting. And I like to actually watch Oxford Street. It tends to be very trendy, because I am interested in window dressing and designing. And so actually I was looking through all the beautiful dressing up. I said, oh my goodness, in Singapore, nothing compared in our region. It was so beautiful that even if you don't buy anything, you just can stand at the, at the window, window shopping, looking at it for hours. Because it's very, very, very innovative. And you know, at the dresses, the clothing there. So I look at men's clothing, women's jewelry, children's clothing and all the bags and, uh, and <laughs> so actually I'm quite good at shopping and, and jewellery. I like, I like precious stones. So actually when I went to uh, Brazil, uh, Rio de Janeiro, my friend, my rich friend, this widow, was saying, what about buying all the different stones from China? So I bought tourmaline, you know, aquamarine, <laughs> and the things that actually are well-known product, products of uh, Brazil and Argentina. <clears throat> now when I was there, actually, in England, I was taking the advantage of uh, looking at new places uh, to do sketching. So this is actually the Hammersmith uh, Hospital, the postgraduate, uh, Royal Postgraduate Medical School. This is a medical school. Actually, it is red brick color. And you can see these plants were actually in full bloom. The cherry blossoms are in full bloom. They're different from the, the, the one in Japan and Korea, where these are double, more than double petal, and they are pink and red. They're full of it, so it was very beautiful. And you can see there are two hospital staff with their overcoat there. And this is actually, I'm afraid that no, it's not in focus. This is actually a bronze statue, my first experience. A lot of things, eh? when you go there, you better do it in your first experience because after some time, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. This is one of the, the bronze statues that, that I, I paint. Okay, I just go. This is called Lupin. This is a plant, and, and I was very fascinated by this plant, which looks like that. This is a photo 
our plant, and this is Edinburgh. When I was at the Edinburgh University, I stayed quite close uh, to you know the cathedral and so on. So it was a very it was, and then this is a beautiful meadow in England. I love this to look at this, you know. And I was, and then okay, now it comes to my own artwork. My artwork has appeared in all the publications of the Asian Pacific Federation. I just submitted another one which they want to use it for cover. So this is a cover for the Asian Pacific Federation newsletter which they publish. Now yeah, the publication has become something like 80 pages and is available uh, as an e-copy online. And this is actually the Critical Chemistry. It's a well-known uh, journal for laboratory medicine. And when they started a section called the, the, the right the right part of the brain. They want to feature um, people who are actually talented in the art. So they want to feature my painting. So the chief editor, which from Harvard, wrote to me and want to publish my painting. So I, this is one of my paintings. Actually, if the result is not so good, it's much better on the computer screen. But I think it's magnified and it's too bright here. So you can't you lose some of the detail. It's uh, actually in spring in the water town in China. This is actually a uh, uh, bamboo grove and these are birch trees which I love. It, they are white bark with um, markings on the trunk and in, in sort of uh, autumn it's very beautiful. So this is a photo of the... and this is a winter scene covered with snow. And this is a couplet actually in Zhuang script. The Zhuang script is also known as the seal script. It's used to do all this carving of name. It's an ancient script dated from the time of the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang Emperor. So these are actually uh, it's a poem, which are breaking up actually into fragments and to look like seals. And so in each one, you will read on the right hand side, it's actually read down, write down. So uh, the, the entire thing is actually a verse. And on two sides are two of my, uh, my artwork, one on, on fans. Fan, round fan, and the usual fan, and this is in praise of plum blossom, and the other side is in praise of bamboo. And this is actually at an exhibition. I was invited National Day Art Exhibition, invited by our um, High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, Mr. Tan Kaho. In fact, Mr. Tan Khan is in her midst. Then he hosted. Uh, uh, it was quite a nice uh, exhibition at Colombo in in a bank building. And this is one of the exhibitions where I was giving the opening speech. And I was in China to, to give an ex organized exhibition in Suzhou, in Hangzhou, in Beijing at the Palace Museum, and Shanghai also in a, in a museum, and uh, also in the city of Peony Flower, uh, Luoyang. And this is in Danmi, which is in actually Guangxi province. And uh, you notice that these are the people are uh, hosts in China, and these are the ethnic minority which are uh, opening the cere opening ceremony. This is a National Day Art Exhibition organized by the uh, Nian Cultural Center, where our honored guests two of two of them in charge of culture in front, Mr. Ang and Mr. Chua. And okay, this section uh, shows my painting. It will go very quickly. This is one of my paintings showing after the rain. You know, the water uh, actually flow through and make a lot of waterfalls and flow through into the river. And this is actually, uh, you know, highlight of, you know, a red umbrella. The person, it is a drizzling day where it's underneath the willow tree. There is somebody admiring the lotus pond, the lotus in the pond, uh, you know, and this person is bringing food for him. And this is one of the more traditional ones in uh, entirely in black and white uh, painting of Chinese painting. This is, I love bamboos and different ways of painting bamboos. So this is one of the paintings showing bamboos in the mountain and waterfall. This, unfortunately, you know, it doesn't show so well because I think it's overexposed. The details you can't see because it's an entire bamboo grove. Bamboos are beautiful in China, in Korea, and in uh, actually uh, Japan. You, you remember those who, re who see Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon. Uh, you see Zhao Yinfa actually fighting on top of the, of the bamboo tree, jumping from one another. It was a very beautiful, the way it was filmed by Li An was to highlight the beauty of bamboos. 
And yes, it's a photograph of bamboo. You see, this is a bamboo grove. See how beautiful? This is another bamboo grove. So you must actually go and see to experience and not just stay here and just imagine. So doing painting means that you actually have to travel a lot to see. And this is pine tree. I had to study how the pine tree grows and what happens when you go to the top. How does it look like? It's different from the willow tree. It's different from a, uh, from a bamboo. So I had to make careful study of the, uh, this is the uh, pine forest and this is pine forest and it's an interesting story you see some scholars gathering on top and then just reciting poetry and playing chess and some others are joining them from below they are going to hike up the mountain uh, so it is and this is actually a painting of the Wu Yang forest is very famous this are in these plants grow in the forest they are said to be able to live for thousands of years uh, because they are very, very hardy. They can grow without water in extreme temperature and yet, you know, they, they can... So I'm showing, you know, the people, uh, uh, Wilger man actually leading uh, the, the, the camels through this forest. You will remember uh, a film called Hero, which was shown, uh, he was featuring this uh, Zhang Ziyi and then I think it was Maggie Chung also. Both of them were wearing bright red against a whole sea of yellow and they were uh, fighting, stop fighting. It was a beautiful... The story actually hero was about the assassination, assassination of the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang. <laughs> and these ladies were brought in and uh, they, they were very beautiful. And this is actually to show you how the Wu Yang tree looked like. You know, the, the, another photo of Wu Yang forest. Oh, this, I think those who've been to China will know the most famous one of the. This is in Lijiang, in Guilin. The, all the scenery is like that. You know, the mountain will rise right from the river. And nowhere else you see in the world. You know, the mountains in, in China are different. That's why it's so challenging actually to do landscape painting and to paint mountains. So this is actually, and, and these are actually fishing with using cormorants, the birds, eh, to, to do fishing. And this is another traveling through the, sailing through the gorge. China has a lot of gorges, mountains and gorges. This is a scene of a covered bridge in winter in a mountain. This is a morning scene of a mountain village. And then this is again another scene of willow, challenging to, for me to paint willow trees. This is a painting of four, the four different flowers for the four seasons. Peony in spring, uh, lotus in summer, Chrysanthemum in autumn and plum in winter. Now, China has not decided what to choose for the national flower. Because for a long time they've been deliberating which one to choose. They haven't come to a conclusion. This show, shows uh, the squirrels uh, uh, taking hawthorn. You know hawthorn food, fruit is very healthy fruit. Uh, actually they make it into sweets with uh, teeth and all that. These are hawthorns. And this... Uh, Rabbits taking their favorite food, and then in winter they show the pet sparrows actually a uh, snow covered uh, bamboo, and this is another traditional landscape, and this is actually a clerical script. This is a calligraphy in clerical script, which is different from the Zhuang script, and it has to be exactly you know aligned both horizontally and vertically. And, and this is another way of writing, which is actually a running script and with the painting uh, of lotus. And this is uh, also another uh, way of painting the lotus. And the, the two words are listening to the rain. And you can see the rain drops on the lotus leaf landed on. And this is a, another water village. This is peony, and you can see peony in this different, different color. And this is actually uh, showing a Qing Dynasty princess walking in the imperial garden. So she's in the you know, typical Qing Dynasty. And this is a painting within a painting within a painting. The, you know, the, the, that is shows a scholar actually doing a painting. He is very well known for his work on snow-covered banana and, uh, oh sorry, uh, and also bamboo. So you, you can see that in the room, uh, he is there on the wall. There hangs a painting done by him, and he's about to do another one. And outside is his favorite also. He also very well known for painting grapes. 
but unfortunately the, the color doesn't uh, come uh, not right. Now, just to let you know that my actual paintings will be shown in the exhibition organized by the, by the NUS Museum. This will actually be uh, put up uh, the true painting, my paintings are actually uh, four feet by two or two and a half feet or five feet long. And this will be uh, in the museum uh, from March, actually end of March, until August. So, so if you have time, now what gives me the inspiration? Therefore, I have to visit a lot of places and this is Zhang Jia Jie. There's some call it the Hallelujah Mountain. And you remember Avatar, the film Avatar is taken in this place. Actually, they show when the clouds are floating around, it shows that the whole rock is actually floating. And at one time, even China wanted to rename this Zhang Jia Jie as Hallelujah Mountain. But a lot of local people sort of objected uh, to, to the foreign name. And this is a beautiful site for painting, actually. And it's a picture of the Yellow Mountain. I remember uh, before even there was any chair, you know, I mean, um, chair lift or whatever, I had to hike up the mountain walking five hours to the top and another five hours down. So I had to stay uh, on top and then, you know, overnight. It's a beautiful mountain and many artists actually visit this place. This is another view of the Yellow Mountain. And in some places, actually, you walk, it allows only one person to pass. And, uh, you know, some people cannot go up, so they use these people hire carrier to, <laughs> to sit on the sedan chair. So this is another park with beautiful pine, uh, pine trees. And this is another place called the Hanging, Hanging Temple, Hengsan, in Hengsan. It's actually an architectural wonder, you know, they built on this. And it's many, many hundred years. And you find that, you know, those uh, wooden sticks are hardly supporting, you know, but it's built into the mountain. So this is... And I also visited all uh, beautiful gardens. And see, this is the Bouchard Garden in Canada. You know, Bouchard, yes. And this was one of the trips when I went to Israel and Jordan. And this is going into the city of Petra. It took four hours to walk to inside to have lunch, and then four hours to hike, to walk back again. And then through all this, there's no plant there. And there are people, actually the nomads still staying there. And they go around in their camels. So these are more, four more pictures of this, in the, the views there. And you can see it's wonderful architecture. You know, you wonder how they could carve out of this. All the buildings are out of rocks, you know. And this is an, actually another you know, 240 waterfall. I call the world's largest and most spectacular waterfall is the Iguazu waterfall. So we went there and go to the national park from Brazil side, the Brazil National Park, to view from the below, and then go to Argentina's national park to view from the top. This is a view from the Argentinian side, where you can see, actually we took one of these boats and went under this fall. Then we were warned, you will be all wet. So don't, <laughs> so don't bring your camera and so, so, so just bring your slippers and, and also poncho. <laughs> it was a real good fun. We had a good bath underneath the waterfall. And this was a, another interesting hike up the mountain, Machu Picchu. Uh, so it's uh, again another inspiration to look at different view. And this was at Cape of Good Hope at South Africa. Uh, and, and I went to you know, the Table Mountain and then the, the Elizabeth Park. And it is a beautiful scene of Nairobi. Actually, the whole of Nairobi, you can go to the city center and you find that it's covered by this jacaranda tree, which flowers particularly well in Africa, in South Africa as well as in Nairobi. I was in Nairobi as a representative of Singapore under the Commonwealth Foundation. I was, giving, I was invited to give two presentations on behalf of the Singapore Professional Centre as a chairman. And, and then it was a great you know, honor to be able to travel through the whole of Kenya in the, in, in the private bus of the A Automobile Association president, let us use. So three of us were travelling in this bus and go to all the games reserved. You know, we stay in the, you know, the lodge on the trees and then watch the animal and then or go to the lakeside and uh, also go to the centre. So we went to a lot of places in Kenya, which looked, by the way, like Scotland. 
And part of it looks like it's England. <laughs> it actually, it's a wonderful experience. And this is one of my more recent trips called Plit, Plit Lift Windsor, the lake. This is 16 lake cascading down, you know, waterfall. So when you walk in this national park, you will find the waterfalls around you, below you, above you, everywhere waterfall. So this is actually in Croatia. Croatia is very well known for its national park. Uh, and uh, this next one is a fantastic view of actually an island where there is a church in the middle. It's in Slovenia. And this lake is called Black Lake, B-L-E-D, Black Lake. And uh, we had to actually take a boat to, to visit the, the, the island. It's uh, actually a good view for painting also. This is a castle at Lake, uh, and, uh, lake Black. And also, in order to paint, actually you also, also like to, uh, I also like to look at other people's painting. This is actually one of the painting, and one of the big art show. You know, these are made up of what? Butterflies. All the blue color are this uh, gigantic uh, butterfly, which are shimmering blue color. They are beautiful. And this painting, I think probably is by Damien Hurst. And I asked, it's cost two million pounds, uh, more than two million pounds. <laughs> And then, this is an unusual painting. I show this because this is a traditional painting, but you look sideways, it's like uh, three-dimensional. They are made of nails, N-I-A-L, nails. <laughs> and all the nails made up of this painting is uh, very unusual. And you can see this uh, painting uh, of Andy Warhol uh, using butterfly to, to actually make into this painting. Apparently, I think one of his paintings sold at a recent uh, art exhibition in Singapore Art Stage for more than $2 million. And, and this is another unusual painting. They are green stones, something like jade, but they are identical. But it depends on how you place the stone. Some of them, you know, reflect in white colour, some are in darker green and some in lighter green. And this is actually a portrait painting of Van Gogh, the famous paint, uh, artist. And you know, so we paint Van Gogh using actually stone, entirely made up of stone. And this is another very interesting artwork. <laughs> you, know, you know, it looks like the, is, is the, the floor is entirely a lake. This is actually a photo. It's an artwork of a photo. And this is a, actually an Indian artist's work. Also, I find it very unusual. And this is actually a painting, a large painting. There are a series of four. One show is showing Putin, but it, the same painting is shown in the next slide. <laughs> all, all you do is that you just step sideways and you see that Putin has changed into a lady, quite a fierce lady, <laughs> with an eyebrow, unusual eyebrow. Uh, actually, I, 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 I didn't show there yeah, because of time, because there was another one showing Obama, Likewise, he changed into a woman. <laughs> and then, likewise, it's even more funny, is the North Korean president, Kim. <laughs> and also, so there are several which are, you know, so you can see, the, actually painting can be quite fun. And of course, these are not cheap. <laughs> and these are among my collections. I just want to show this lovely, transparent, translucent grapes by an uh, artist from Shanghai. He's a very well-known artist. And this is another one. It didn't, you see all the blue section, they actually are painted out, but you can't see because uh, uh, I think that it's poorly reproduced. It's a large painting, I think under, like, much like the other artist, O'Keefe, you know, uh, American artist, which paint a large flower. And this is actually a wall mural, which uh, is among one of, um, one of the many paintings that I have. Okay, thank you. And I would like to thank God for his guidance and blessings. Uh, that I have such a great, and this is actually the program that I'll be playing for you after the break. And I've selected the music because I know it's a mixed audience, so I've deliberately chose pieces which are easy to hear, to the ear and, and tuneful. But nevertheless, they're all famous artists, and some of them, like my, uh, uh, my vintage, <laughs> will like the, to, to the tango which was very, very famous everywhere. You hear this uh, jealousy. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we will start. Uh, Dr. Tan will play the piano for us. And uh, 
list of songs that are listed on the screen. Yeah. So Dr. Tan, please. 